Today we are going to have reading aloud, um, do some objectionable poetry. Um, this is many years, I know, tell us how many, <laughs> that they have shared this um, event with us and we're very grateful that they are back again this year. And so we'll just get started. Right. <clears throat> reading Aloud is privileged to be back again for the sixth year in reading for, at the Intellectual Freedom Festival. Um, when we started, um, it was something of a challenge to find poems. Now it really isn't. But our title this year is perhaps a little misleading. I can think of one of the poems that will be read that is clearly objectionable. The others are more that the poets are objecting to something that is in the world. Um, we are happy today to have two guest readers, Rob Dietrich, who is an, actually an emeritus member of Reading Aloud, and Chuck Miller, who is an authority on the Turkish poet whose poem he will read. Uh, the readers who are here are Michael Chan, Carrie Malone, Nancy Lynch, Mary Gutman, Kathy Mitchell, I believe that's it, and I'm Ina Lowenberg. Uh, missing today are our members Chuck Felling, Jim Curry, Johnny Ellsworth, although she is in the audience, uh, and, and um, Betty, Betty Norbeck. So I think we will begin uh, with objectionable or objecting poems. It wasn't loud enough? Yeah, it wasn't on at all. Oh, it wasn't on at all. Then I'll begin again. <laughs> okay. okay. Reading aloud is privileged to be back for the sixth year reading in the Intellectual Freedom Festival. You don't need to do that again. They heard that part. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read three inscriptions from Walt Whitman. First one One self I sing. One self I sing, a simple separate person, yet utter the word democratic, the word a mass, all. Physiology, from top to toe, I sing. Not physiognomy alone, nor brain alone, is worthy for the muse. I say the form complete is worthier far. The female equally with the male, I sing. Of life immense in passion, pulse and power, cheerful for freest action formed under the laws divine. The modern man, I sing. Second one. To the states. To the states or any one of them or any city of the states, resist much, obey little. Once unquestioning obedience, once fully enslaved. Once fully enslaved, no nation, state, city of this earth ever afterward resumes its liberty. Third one, me in perturbe. Me in perturbe, standing at ease in nature, master of all or mistress of all, a plum in the midst of irrational things, imbued a stay, passive, receptive, silent a stay, finding my occupation, poverty, notoriety, foibles, crimes, less important than I thought. Me toward the Mexican Sea, or in the Manhattan, or the Tennessee, or far north or inland. A river man, or a man of the woods, or of any farm life of these states, or of the coast, 
or the lakes or Canada, me, wherever my life is lived, all oh, to be self-balanced for contingencies, to confront night, storms, hunger, ridicule, accidents, rebuffs, as the trees and animals do. The next two poems are by Emily Dickinson. The first, Wild Nights. Wild nights, wild nights, were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury. Feudal the winds to a heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, my I met more tonight in thee. My life had stood, a loaded gun in corners, till a day the owner passed, identified, and carried me away. And now we roam the sovereign woods, and now we hunt the doe. And every time I speak for him, the mountains straight reply. And do I smile, such cordial light upon the valley glow? It is as a Vesuvian face had let its pleasure through. And when at night our good day done, I guard my master's head, tis better than the eider duck's deep pillow to have shared. To foe of his I'm deadly foe, none stir the second time, on whom I lay a yellow eye or an emphatic thumb. Though I than he may longer live, he longer must than I. For I have but the power to kill without the power to die. In 1883, Emma Lazarus wrote a poem called The New Colossus, which many of us are familiar with, particularly to the last lines which are inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Well, in 1892, Thomas Bailey Aldrich wrote a different kind of poem, The Unguarded Gates. Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, and through them passes a wild, motley throng men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Huang Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn, these bringing with them unknown gods and rites, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws in street and alley, what strange tongues are loud, accents of menace alien to our air, voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. O oh, liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? On thy breast fold sorrow's children, soothe the hurts of fate, lift the downtrodden, but with hand of steel, Stay those who to thy sacred portals come to waste the gifts of freedom. Have a care lest from thy brow the clustered stars be torn and trampled in the dust. For so of old the thronging Goth and Vandal trampled Rome. 
and where the temples of the Caesars stood, the lean wolf, unmolested, made her lair. The next two poems are by E.E. E. Cummings. Next to, of course, God, America, I love you, land of the pilgrims and so forth. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early, my country tis of centuries come and go and are no more. What of it? We shall worry in every language, even deaf and dumb. Thy sons acclaim your glorious name by gory, by jingo, by gee, by gosh, by gum. Why talk of beauty? What could be more beautiful than these heroic happy dead who rushed like lions to the roaring slaughter? They did not stop to think. They died instead. Then shall the voice of liberty be mute? He spoke and drank rapidly a glass of water. Now does our world descend the path to nothingness. Cruel now cancels kind. Friends turn to enemies. Therefore lament my dream and don a doer's doom. Create as now contrive. Imagine merely no. <clears throat> Freedom what makes a slave. Therefore my life lie down, and more by most endure all that you never were. Hide poor dishonored mind who thought yourself so wise and much could understand concerning no and yes. If they've become the same, it's time you unbecame. Where climbing was and bright as darkness and to fall now wrongs the only right, since brave are cowards all. Therefore despair my heart and die into the dirt. But from this endless end of briefer each our bliss, where seeing eyes go blind, where lips forget to kiss, where everything's nothing, arise my soul and sing. I wanted to say a few words about Nezim Hikmet. Uh, he, was, he was a Turk, and uh, when the, he heard about a revolution happening in Russia, so he ran off from Turkey and ended up in uh, Moscow and became a communist. He thought Communism made a lot of sense. Under communism, people supposedly had rights and they had enough to eat and so forth and so on. Uh, so he stayed there in uh, Moscow for about four years. In fact, he was there w when Lenin died and they, and they assigned him and a friend who were just like students or cadets to guard Lenin's body while the uh, funeral procession went on. And so he was, he was guarding Lenin's body there uh, and an old woman came up to him and she, and she had a hard time figuring out what was going on. Everything seemed chaotic and strange to her and she didn't know what was happening, but she had heard that Comrade Lenin had died. <coughs> so she asked him, who was guarding Lenin's body, did, did Comrade Lenin die? 
And he said, yes. And she said, oh, we're lost. We're lost now that he's died. Well, it wasn't too long before Stalin took over. And true enough, just like that old woman said, after Stalin took over, they were lost. And so Stalin became a tyrant and, and, and uh, caused the death of millions of people. He invented all the gulags and the prisons and the betrayals of one kind or another. So, so sooner or later, uh, Nazem had to go back to Turkey. He went back and they locked him up in their Turkish prisons. And, and they said, although he hadn't committed any crimes and he wasn't a criminal, really, uh, or a thief, they locked him up in the Turkish prisons. And so he spent uh, almost 25 years in the Turkish prison system. Uh, they'd let him out for a little while and then take him back and so forth and so on. And... Uh, Meanwhile, he was developing a reputation as a writer. Uh, but at one point, he tried to come to the United States to give some readings. Well, because he was a communist, the United States wouldn't let him come. Uh, so he ended up spending almost 25 years in, uh, in Turkish prisons. So finally, they let him out for a little while a kind of vacation or a parole, something like that. And he, di and he didn't trust them anymore after being there 25 years. So, so he got a relative of his who had a motorboat and the guy took him in the motorboat across the body of water there, the Black Sea or, or all those little uh, parts of Turkey and Greece and uh, southern Russia around Odessa. And, and the, the relative landed him in Bulgaria. So at one point he had had a Bulgarian wife and uh, he knew a little bit about Bulgaria. And, and, and Bulgaria had been originally a Turkish tribe who took over from the Slavs that lived there. But they liked the Slavic way of life. Oh, I'm reading too long. Oh, OK. So this, this is a poem he wrote about the United States uh, and, and what he thought of capitalism. A sad state of freedom. You waste the attention of your eyes, glittering labor of your hands, and need the dough enough for dozens of loaves of which you'll taste not a morsel. You are free to slave for others. He means living in a capitalist country, you're free to be their slave. You are free to make the rich richer. The moment you're born, they plant around you mills that grind lies, lies to last you a lifetime. You keep thinking of your great freedom, a finger on your temple, free to have a free conscience, your head bent as if half cut from the nape, your arm, arms long hanging. You saunter about in your great freedom. You're free with the freedom of being unemployed, you love your country as the nearest, most precious thing to you, but one day, for example, they may endorse it over to America, and you too, with your great freedom, you have the freedom to become an airbase. The tentacles of Wall Street may grab you by the neck. They could dispatch you to Korea one of these days, there to fill a hollow with your great freedom. Yes, you're free with the freedom of an unknown soldier. You may proclaim that one must live not as a tool, a number, or a link, but as a human being. Then at once they handcuff your wrists. You are free to be arrested, imprisoned, and even hanged. 
There's neither an iron, wooden, nor a tool, curtain in your life. There's no need to choose freedom. You are free, but this kind of freedom is a sad affair under the stars. The United Fruit Company by Pablo Neruda. When the trumpet sounded, everything was prepared on earth, and Jehovah gave the world to Coca-Cola Inc., Anaconda, Ford Motors, and other corporations. The United Fruit Company reserved for itself the most juicy piece, the central coast of my world, the delicate waste of America. It rebaptized these countries, banana republics, and over the sleeping dead, over the unquiet heroes who won greatness, liberty, and banners, it established an opera buffer. It abolished free will, gave out imperial crowns, encouraged envy, attracted the dictatorship of flies, Trujillo flies, Tachos flies, Calias flies, Martinez flies, Ubico flies, flies sticky with submissive blood and marmalade, drunken flies that buzz over the tombs of the people, circus flies, wise flies, expert at tyranny. With the bloodthirsty flies came the fruit company, amassed coffee and fruit, in ships would put to sea like overloaded trays with the treasures from our sunken lands. Meanwhile, the Indians fall into the sugared depths of the harbors and are buried in the morning mists. A corpse rolls, a thing without name, a discarded number, a bunch of rotten fruit thrown on the garbage heap. Homework by Allen Ginsberg. This poem was written in 1980. If I were doing my laundry, I'd wash my dirty Iran. I'd throw my United States and pour on ivory soap, scrub up Africa, put all the birds and elephants back in the jungle. I'd wash the Amazon River and clean the oily Caribbean Gulf of Mexico, rub that smog off the North Pole, Wipe up all the pipelines in Alaska. Rub-a-dub-dub -dub for Rocky Flats and Los Alamos. Flush that sparkly cesium out of Love Canal. Rinse down the acid rain over the Parthenon and the Sphinx. Drain the sludge out of the Mediterranean basin and make it azure again. Put some bluing back into the sky over the Rhine. Bleach the little clouds so snow returns white as snow. Cleanse the Hudson Thames and Ecker. Drain the suds out of Lake Erie. Then I'd throw Big Asia in one giant load and wash out the blood and Agent Orange. Dump the whole mess of Russia and China in the ringer. Squeeze out the tattletale gray of the U.S. Central American police state. And put the planet in the dryer and let it sit for 20 minutes or an eon till it came out clean. The World is a Beautiful Place by Lawrence Fern Getty, written in 2003. The world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't mind happiness not always being so very much fun. If you don't mind a touch of hell now and then, just when everything is fine, because even in heaven, they don't sing all the time. The world is a beautiful place to be born into 
if you don't mind some people dying all the time, or maybe only starving some of the time, which isn't half bad if it isn't you. Oh, the world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't much mind a few dead minds in the higher places, or a bomb or two now and then in your upturned faces, or such other improprieties as our name brand society is prey to, with its men of distinction and its men of extinction and its priests and other patrolmen. And its various segregations and congressional investigations and other constipations that our full flesh is heir to. Yes, the world is the best place of all for a lot of such things as making the fun scene and making the love scene and making the sad scene and singing low songs and having inspirations and walking around looking at everything and smelling flowers and goosing statues and even thinking and kissing people and making babies and wearing pants and waving hats and dancing and going swimming in rivers on picnics in the middle of the summer and just generally living it up. Yes, and then right in the middle of it comes the smiling mortician. Merciful God, by Katya Molodowski, written in 1945. Merciful God, choose another people, elect another. We are tired of death and dying. We have no more prayers. Choose another people, elect another. We have no more blood to be a sacrifice. Our house has become a desert. The earth is insufficient for our graves. No more laments for us, no more dirges in the old holy books. Merciful God, sanctify another country, another mountain. We have strewn all the fields and every stone with ash, with holy ash. With the aged, with the youthful, and with babies, we have paid for every letter of your Ten Commandments. Merciful God, raise your fiery brow and see the peoples of the world. Give them the prophecies and the days of awe. Your word is babbled in every language. Teach them the deeds, the ways of temptation. Merciful God, give us simple garments of shepherds with their sheep, blacksmiths at their hammers, laundry washers, skin flayers, and even the more base. And do us one more favor. Merciful God, deprive us of the divine presence of genius. From an Unwritten Theory of Dreams by Zbigniew Herbert. The torturers sleep soundly. Their dreams are rosy. Good-natured genocides, foreign and homegrown, already forgiven by brief human memory. A gentle breeze turns the pages of family albums. The windows of the house open to August the shade of an apple tree in bloom, under which a fine brood has gathered, grandfather's open carriage, an expedition to church, first communion, mother's first embrace, a campfire in a clearing, and a starry sky without omens or mysteries, with, without an apocalypse, so they sleep soundly. Their dreams are wholesome, full of food, drink fleshy bodies of women with whom they play erotic games in bushes, in groves, and over it all floats a never forgotten voice, a voice as pure as a spring, innocent as an echo, 
singing of a boy who spied a rose on the heath. Memory's bell awakens no ghosts or nightmares. Memory's bell repeats its great absolution. They wake in the morning full of will and strength. Together, excuse me, carefully they shave their bourgeois cheeks. What remains of their hair they style as a laurel wreath. In the waters of oblivion that wash all away, they lather their bodies with soap of the brand Macbeth. Why does sleep, the shelter of all human beings, withhold its grace from the victims of violence? Why do they bleed at night between clean sheets and enter their beds as if they were torture chambers? Cells on death row or the shadow of the gallows. After all, they too had mothers, and they have seen the woods, clearing sky, blossoming apple tree, rose. Who drove it from every corner of their souls? They too experience moments of happiness, so why does their howling awaken the innocent household? Why do they tear off yet again in their mad escape? beating their heads on a wall, and then sleep no more, staring dully at the clock which won't change a thing. Memory's bell repeats its great terror. Memory's bell beats an unceasing alarm. It's truly hard to admit the torturers won the victory. The victims have been vanquished for all of eternity. So they must make terms with this punishment, without guilt, with the scar of shame, the finger marks on their cheeks, the abject will to survive, the temptation of forgiveness, the story of hell is now rightly felt to be in bad taste. There's no longer any place to lodge your complaint. The tribunal of dreams delivers unfathomable, unfathomable verdicts. Edge by Sylvia Plath. And this poem was written just a few months before her suicide. The woman is perfected. Her dead body wears the smile of accomplishment. The illusion of a Greek necessity flows in the scrolls of her toga. Her bare feet seem to be saying, we have come so far, it is over. Each dead child coiled a white serpent, one at each little pitcher of milk, now empty. She has folded them back into her body as petals of a rose close when the garden stiffens, and older odors bleed from the sweet, deep throats of the night flower. The moon has nothing to be sad about. Staring from her hood of bone, she is used to this sort of thing, her blacks crackle and drag. Her Kind by Anne Sexton. I have gone out a possessed witch haunting the black air, braver at night, dreaming evil I have done my hitch over the plain houses, light by light. Lonely thing, twelve-fingered out of mind. A woman like that is not a woman quite. I have been her kind. I have found the warm caves in the woods, filled them with skillets, carving shelves, closets, silks, innumerable goods fix the suppers for the worms and the elves, whining, rearranging the disaligned. A woman like that is misunderstood. I have been her kind. I have ridden in your cart, driver, waved my nude arms at villages going by, learning the last bright roots, survivor, where your flames still bite my thigh and my ribs crack where your wheels wind. A woman like that is not ashamed to die. I have been her kind.
The Rose That Grew From Concrete by Tupac Shakur. Did you hear about the rose that grew from a crack in the concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems, but by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from concrete, when no one else even cared. The next piece is an excerpt from Hamilton, the wildly successful musical brought to Broadway by Lin-Manuel Miranda in 2016. Broadway's Hamilton contains rap lyrics and hip hop music in a portrayal of one of the nation's most celebrated founding fathers. The Broadway version of Hamilton begins this way. How does a bastard orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence impoverished in squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar? The $10 founding father without a father got a lot farther by working a lot harder, by being a lot smarter, by being a self-starter. By 14, they placed him in charge of a trading charter and every day, while slaves were being slaughtered and carted away across the waves, he struggled and kept his guard up. Inside, he was longing for something to be a part of. The brother was ready to beg, steal, borrow, or barter. Then a hurricane came, and devastation reigned. Our man saw his future drip, dripping down the drain, put a pencil to his temple, connected it to his brain, and he wrote his first refrain, a testament to his pain. Well, the, the word got around. They said, this kid is insane, man. Took up a collection just to send him to the mainland. Get your education. Don't forget from whence you came, and the world is going to know your name. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton, and there's a million things I haven't done. But just you wait. Just you wait. Patricia Smith published a book called Incendiary Art in 2017, and several of the poems begin with a clipping from a newspaper story, as this one does. It is otherwise untitled. March 12, 2012, Pasadena, California. Kendrick McDade, 19, was chased and shot seven times by two police officers after a 9-11 caller falsely reported being robbed at gunpoint by two black men. McDade's final words were, why did they shoot me? As the moon tangled its beams and grew monstrous huge over his body, he wanted that answer. As usual, I arrived too late. He had already dispersed and become an awkward hour. Son of the mother of mistake, his timing and route were askew, but because walk, because upright, because Africa, because decision, because Tuesday, because loaded gun, because running, because too black, because identified, because uniform, because breathless, because unable, because America, because your mama, because because Mississippi, because uniform, because Obama, because the chase, because unarmed, because convenient, because mistaken, because threatened, because ritual, because no one will miss you, because beast, because innocent, because they could, because they could, because they could, because they could, because they... 
I usually give my boys names anybody can remember. Scapegoat, target, perp walk, he did it oversight. The name Kendrick so quashed his potential. He should have been victim, identify, bullseye, not again, miracle, two black men with gun. How about accident? Perfect. I never had children. I just had accidents. Ad Astra per Aspera, Western Metal Arc by Kevin Young. Land of unlikely, land of no sea, land of all you can eat, land of 17, land of silos, missiles, and otherwise, land of squinting eyes, land of wheat and milo, land of bejeweled jorts, land of A&W, of Gates Barbecue, these are my dressiest shorts. Land of gray ash, land of acid wash, land of winded cough, of neatly piled trash, land of squat buildings and broad slate sky, land of land never ending, land of doesn't matter why, land of soft serve, land of dead man's curve, land of lost mutts, I'm not racist, but land of summer severe, land of persevere, land of nothing near, into this here strode tall John Brown, in one hand a Bible, the other a rifle, faced more scowl than frown. The United States welcomes you by the current Poet Laureate of the United States, Tracy K. Smith. Why and by whose power were you sent? What do you see that you may wish to steal? Why this dancing? Why do your dark bodies drink up all the light? What are you demanding that we feel? Have you stolen something? Then. What is that leaping in your chest? What is the nature of your mission? Do you seek to offer a confession? Have you anything to do with others brought by us to harm? Then why are you afraid? And why do you invade our night, hands raised, eyes wide, mute as ghosts? Is there something you wish to confess? Is this some enigmatic type of test? What if we fail? How and to whom do we address our appeal? <coughs> Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did Gyre and gimble in the wabe, all mimsy were the borogoves, and the moam wraths out grave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and bird and shun the frumptious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by, tum t by the tum-tum tree and stood a while while in thought. And as in you fish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes aflame came whiffling through the tuggy wood a burble as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing 
back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borough groves, and the moam wraths outgrain. We thought we would leave you with a happier, not a happier note. So thank you very much for coming.